and now going go live. You can start. Whenever I can start, yeah? No, uh, so hello everybody and welcome. I'm Iverica Granate, the head of the Department of International Relations at Village Conservatory, and also in collaboration with Malmö Academy of Music, I'd like to open the third session of the International Panel Discussion Series, Freedom in Music Education. Before we begin our meeting, as uh, stated, I'd like to state also that we are horrified by the Russia's uh, attack and the war in Ukraine. The State Conservatory strongly supports Ukrainian friends and colleagues there, and also we are ready to welcome the Ukrainian students at the State Conservatory. Uh, we understand that the Ukraine uh, needs everybody's support now, strong support from the Western allies, and as the battle is for general peace in the world and in Europe, and uh, freedom in the democratic world. Um, after this note, I'd like to remind you that uh, we have the six meetings uh, for uh, within this project, and it will be um, discussed the current challenges of the higher music education. International experts, professional musicians, and representatives of higher educational institutions will be the speakers of the events from more than 10 countries of the world. Discussions are live streamed on the State Conservatory Facebook page every day at 4 CT from February 28th to April the 4th. The main topic of the third meeting is um, East West um, Divide, building bridges or deepening the gap. And our speakers today are uh, Edgar Zagiskis, is a composer, musicologist, uh, culture journalist from Latvia, uh, Thomas Winter. Uh, he's a former rector at the Royal Academy of Music in Aarhus, Denmark. Uh, Hans Selsten, he's a vice rector at uh, Malmö Academy of Music uh, at Lund University in Sweden. And we will have also Dave David Aladashvili. He's a pianist, TV presenter, PhD student at Tbilisi State Conservatory from Georgia. Uh, I'm very proud to have you all here. For our third session, we asked our participants to discuss following issues. Uh, Fukuyama's theory was nothing but utopia. What is ahead? Uh, the process of transition and democratization at high music educational institutions. What are the government's policies in and what advantages or disadvantages it has when it comes to the performance? And we're happy to have Edgar Draginskis as our first speaker. He's a Latvian composer, musicologist, culture journalist, and a PhD candidate at the Hong Kong Baptist University Department of Music. He is researching musical censorship in the Composers' Union, the former Latin Soviet Socialist Republic. He specializes in modern, uh, moderating live broadcasts from the concert halls and other venues, contemporary music productions from, uh, for the media, pre-recorded and live interviews. His compositional interest predominantly gravitated towards the music for the stage. And as of September 2021, Edgar is a member of the executive board uh, of the Latvian Composers Union. So dear Edgar, the floor is yours and we'll be listening to you. Thank you kindly. Let me first share the screen, if I may, and please indicate if you see my screen. Yes, yes, super, thank you. Super. Then I will start. Uh, so, in the scope of the today's discussion, uh, the topic I'm going to present uh, is uh, very interesting for me, both as a composer and uh, as a censorship scholar, because uh, it uh, signals and it uh, in the same time embodies uh, the divide, uh, bridging the gap between West and East, then uh, again widening it and now in contemporary Latvia trying to narrow and maybe eliminate the gap altogether once again. So, um, as you probably all know, uh, Latvia is one of the Baltic states and it was independent from 1918 to 1945, or let's say even less, 1939, and uh, then it was occupied by Soviet Union and uh, we regained our stately independence in 1991, once again. So, uh, the totalitarian and the democratic system uh, and the specifics of these systems uh, is very... 
um, evident in the current cultural climate of uh, Latvia and also in its music, higher music education. So let's uh, first start with uh, one uh, slight question, which I was faced uh, when I started my music education in 1990 or 1991. Uh, although it was already the independent Republic of Latvia, we still had uh, the residual effects of the former Soviet Union. And how couldn't we? Because all the teaching staff at the music schools, uh, conservatories and other educational institutions uh, was uh, itself taught in the Soviet uh, system and within the Soviet doctrine, so it had strict standards uh, to which to adhere, and also the youngsters who needed to be uh, brought up uh, in the cultural uh, educational system of Latvia also needed to be brought uh, up uh, along those lines, because there were none other lines to be spoken about at that time. So. Um, in the creative process, it is uh, uh, extra important to consider the, uh, this parameter of may or can, of being able to do something uh, within uh, the creative scope of one's uh, expertise or maybe um, just uh, emerging expertise of some musical instrument or composition or music theory or whatever. And uh, during my early years at the music school, me together with other students uh, and basically with other kids, we were constantly at odds with this uh, principle of on, on one hand, our teachers told us that we can do whatever we want and uh, to um, express uh, ourselves in uh, the best manner uh, for we, we see fit. But on the other hand, I still encountered situations uh, in my piano uh, training because I graduated as a professional pianist uh, where I was uh, suddenly approached by my teacher who said that you can play it either this way which is right or you can play it the other way which is wrong and the second way was no option yeah so a non-starter so keep that in mind now uh, certain theoretical aspects and uh, theoretical things which uh, i would like you to dwell on a little bit uh, this is from uh, one of my favorite uh, theoreticians uh, which i'm basing my doctoral research on uh, it's pg ingram and it concerns specifically um, censorship theory uh, from the philosophical standpoint. That means not taking any sides and considering both the liberal and the totalitarian approach. And uh, well, just uh, thinking about that uh, restrictions during the process of education uh, are inevitable. And basically these restrictions are put there uh, by the system, by the current political system, um, specifically to cater to the needs of the children, uh, considering their um, maybe, let's say, volatile and still forming mind. Yeah, but uh, of course, the needs are I put in quotation marks because as the person grows older, uh, one understands more and more about their own individual needs and less about uh, their adherence to the system as the pre predominant uh, aspect of their personality. So this is the first uh, aspect. The second aspect is that uh, this uh, complete uh, freedom in the ed educational process, neither in totalitarian nor in liberal society, uh, is uh, really an option because you can see that uh, otherwise children could be easily exposed to things they really should not be exposed to. And um, uh, this uh, belligerent behavior uh, from the others uh, could spill over to, to youngsters. Uh, I am still focusing on the young people because uh, although we are discussing higher education, we still need to uh, understand where it all stems from, uh, especially um, uh, from which paradigm are we viewing uh, the freedom in education and music education and also uh, limits of this freedom. So, yeah, uh, there is a certain certain difference between uh, inculcation of opinions uh, and indoctrination. And one idea is to provide uh, students with um, various standpoints and uh, maybe steer them to the direction of the right behavior or socially responsible be behavior for the current uh, system. And the other, uh, especially um, relatable uh, to those who uh, have been brought up in the totalitarian state is, of course, uh, this indoctrination. And the Soviet paradigm or Bolshevik paradigm specifically emphasized that uh, creation of uh, ad adhering and self-censoring 
mentoring individual is paramount for ideological purposes so uh, that the young professional of whichever field would just um, uh, follow the party lines and not even engage in anything remotely potentially uh, defiant of the political system. Uh, now a little bit about the Music Academy of Latvia. It is two years younger than the Tbilisi Music Conservatory. Uh, it was founded in 1919 and it was uh, well, a huge success during the first period of independent Latvia, as uh, Latvian musicians who were studying there, uh, they were able to go to Western Europe and to enrich themselves with musical experiences from the Western world. Their professors had studied uh, at the conservatories both in the West and the East, uh, the magnificent Moscow and St. Petersburg, also Kiev uh, conservatories, and uh, yeah, the Western Europe uh, also. So it was a huge shock when uh, the second Second World War transformed uh, the educational institutions and uh, well uh, integrated, let's say, it, let's put it mildly, the conservatory into the Soviet educational system. And although we regained our independence and Music Academy uh, also became an, again an independent institution in 1991, we are still struggling with the residual effects of this uh, Soviet period. Not everything was, let's say, bad, uh, if we like the polarization of bad and good and good and evil uh, during the Soviet time, but some things were different, uh, to say the least. So let's start with those uh, differences uh, in higher music education in totalitarian society. Obviously, if I will try to be very detailed about all those discrepancies, I would probably extend my time to an understandable length, so I'll be brief, but uh, let's say that the first line you can see about this limited access to music education or unrestricted access uh, based on ideological parameters uh, was there for many people who had, um, how to say, stained uh, biographies, and stained uh, by stained I mean people who were uh, from uh, bourgeoisie families who had some uh, Christian ministers in their families or whatever the state found to be uh, belligerent or, uh, well, unadhering to the uh, political system. Uh, well, and the second uh, element or the second row of uh, this table is basically uh, the key aspect, the dedicated ideological education, the Marxist, the communist, the Bolshevik education, which was there in whichever uh, academy you think of. It was there in Georgia, it was there in Latvia and other Soviet countries. And uh, this was the poison, let's say, uh, that uh, poisoned the, um, all the um, students who went into the higher music education and uh, it continues to some degree maybe poison some of the older generation representatives uh, still until now until nowadays although to much lesser degree of course um, so uh, the totalitarian regime or restrictive regimes uh, favor certain uh, musical styles and somehow neglect others let's say modernist movement of uh, the 20th century was uh, unavailable for many students of uh, higher music education education uh, institutions in Latvia, and that is gone, luckily. And uh, also, when people wanted to pl play, for example, music uh, of sacred nature or some sacred church genres, well, it's probably hard to say if anyone found oneself to be willing to do that uh, at certain moments, especially uh, during the Stalin Stalinist era. But uh, regardless, uh, then uh, there was a huge ideological pressure on that as well. And uh, living behind the Iron Curtain, uh, Latvian musicians during the Soviet times uh, could not participate in many musical events which could lead to uh, their musical and cultural enrichment and to facilitate uh, the cultural bond between the East and the West. I, I think I do not need to explain any, any further with that. And um, speaking about uh, this pressure and psychological pressure, uh, it was not only regarding the repertoire, but also the musical performances, the dominant strains or dominant traditions within the musical performance, those of the Soviet uh, tradition and those of the, uh, how to say, decadent Western influences, which were not to be followed, although when uh, certain bright um, performers came to East, let's say Van Cliburn comes to mind first, uh, people still try to imitate him uh, regardless. But yeah, the psychological pressure was there. Um, again, uh, the 
second row of uh, this table is very important and uh, something we are still struggling with uh, up until nowadays because if a new political system comes into power it tries to eliminate all the residual effects or residual all, all the how to say memories of the uh, previous political system those composers who were alive and working in the first uh, independent latvia they found themselves personas non grata uh, during the soviet times and even if they could continue their musical work it was very very uh, different from uh, before the Soviet uh, authorities came into power and many students who started their education during the Soviet times they did not know any about uh, many cultural accomplishments of the younger days and uh, that in turn somehow um, facilitated uh, the generational gap between uh, the people of uh, today and people of uh, yesterday and uh, Although we are trying to, again, uh, give voices to those who were silenced back then and uh, try to unearth the artifacts of uh, our musical heritage, it is still sometimes uh, a bit sporadic or maybe it remains quite a challenge for uh, certain people. And uh, the last one is, of course, uh, which relates to my research, my PhD research is the coercion and censorship, for example, of composition students. Uh, let's look at those two guys. Uh, the person on the left you probably all more or less are familiar with, it's Peter Svasks, uh, the most famous Latvian composer of the contemporary age, and uh, he was also my teacher during my student years at the Latvian um, Emil Zlatinch Music High School. And uh, this person is a son of a Baptist priest. That meant that when he came to Latvian State Conservatory in 1960s, in the late 60s, he was turned down and basically uh, hushed away from the music academy. So because you are the son of a minister, you cannot study here because your biography is not good. What did he do? He went to Lithuania because um, the uh, party uh, apparatus in Latvia and Lithuania was not in this, such a good contact. He And also Lithuanians were far more patriotic and nationalist in their uh, worldview, they allowed Peter Svask to study at the Lithuanian Conservatory. Uh, regardless, he was able to later study as a um, double bass player uh, in, in, in Latvia as well, so um, that was uh, an accomplishment for him. And the person on the right is Aldo Aniskalnic, who is a, he's still in, uh, alive and active. I mean, alive and active, I'm saying with a certain, uh, well, in, it's not incidental because he's 96 or 97 already and I interviewed him uh, as a part of my PhD research and he told that uh, during his student years uh, due to his bourgeois or let's say peasant uh, upbringing and all his relatives were sent to prison and to uh, gulag uh, he had to uh, adhere to party standards and try to uh, be let's say extra communist in his worldview and uh, create silly compositions like uh, or collective farm workers march or uh, walls of uh, co collective farm director like it, it blows your mind away but uh, regardless he had to go uh, jump through, uh, through those hoops and it is only one example in Peter Swast is also another example but there were many many of uh, those during the Soviet times luckily not not anymore now, uh, what can be done and what has been done? Of course, the institutions have been re reorganized and Latvian Music uh, Conservatory is not uh, anymore um, as it was, no ideological uh, education, etc. Uh, also, the, the inner infrastructure and uh, who is um, dependent uh, on whom uh, has been... Uh, how to say, uh, altered, but the, uh, still the psychological um, aspect of uh, the older generation or, um, yeah, those who studied and were teachers in the Soviet times has to be uh, taken into consideration because those people, uh, although uh, we came to the democratic system of contemporarity in 1991, uh, they still struggle with uh, trying to um, combine what they were taught during the Soviet times and what they 
they see nowadays in the independent democratic system. And uh, of course, these are the generational differences. Although I can say that the youngsters uh, who are nowadays uh, studying at the conservatory, they're of completely different breed and they probably do not even um, bother themselves with the question I asked in the beginning of this uh, talk. So my timer is up and I think that uh, my speech is also up and I hope you got some ideas about my contemplations and maybe uh, got some food for thought yourselves as well. So thank you kindly for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much. It was very interesting. And of course, as a cultural journalist, you had a perfect timing, right? Uh, and I, I'm, I'm astonished that, that how many similarities, of course, uh, I'm not surprised uh, the Georgian and the Latvian uh, music academics and conservatory have. And I, I'm very happy that we have here like three Berlin Wall uh, division with a, like equal representation of the uh, speakers. And especially like self-censoring like we still have like today a, a lot of uh, issues concerning that as well at uh, even in the Swedish state conservatory and uh, i just want to say to my to our viewers on uh, facebook that you can ask the questions in the comments and then in the end of the session we will be able to um, answer the questions uh, you might have and also like uh, some small disclaimer here that our speakers are uh, stating their own individual uh, views and that might not represent the view of the Twitter State Conservatory. And our next speaker, uh, thank you, Edgar, again very much. And the uh, next speaker is uh, Thomas Winter. He is, um, uh, it, it is uh, through management of major institutions, complicated team building processes within uh, them and heading up large music productions. Thomas Winter uh, has developed his experience as a leader of cultural institutions and as an internationally accomplished producer of music. In 2008, Thomas Winter uh, was appointed rector of the Royal Academy of Music in Aarhus, uh, Denmark, and the largest conservatory in Denmark measured by numbers of students. Uh, in 2019, Thomas was elected president of the Association of Danish Music and Culture Schools. As president, uh, he represents 98 schools within the uh, uh, nationwide and also the school's political and strategic interests in relation to the Ministry of Culture and the municipalities. So, Thomas, thank you for being with us and we'll be listening to you. Thank you very much. Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, uh, I used to work at the Danish Broadcasting Corporation, and we always said that it was a really good broadcast if the timing was right. Uh, so our previous speaker actually made a very, very good speech. Thank you very much. Uh, as uh, Ivory said, uh, I'm Thomas Winter. I have been working as a rector for the Royal Academy of Music in Aarhus and Aalborg. And before that, I was also uh, head of studies and vice rector at the Royal Danish Academy of Music in Copenhagen. So uh, although it's been a few years since I have worked in higher music education, it is uh, still uh, relatively present for me. Um, the given topic for today is, of course, uh, the East-West divide, building bridges or deepening the gap, a topic that has become so much more relevant today than it was, I'm sure, when the title was first conceived. I am going to talk about this uh, subject, but maybe in a slightly twisted way and looking at some of the issues here in a, a helicopter perspective. Um, but here it goes. Um, our liberal democracies are under pressure. And now after the Russian invasion and the Ukraine, uh, maybe even under threat. I work on this short talk in the days uh, Russia launches its full-scale invasion of the Ukraine. I am, like most other people, outraged by the act of violence and the attack on democracy that the Russian government has launched on Ukraine. I'm saddened by the horrific terror inflicted on the Ukrainian people, and I am deeply worried about nationalistic populism in general. There are also Russian troops in Georgia. Likewise, I would like to express my solidarity with the people of Georgia 
who's also experiencing the consequences of the Putin regime's expansionistic ambitions. So are we building bridges or are we deepening the gap? It is my sincere hope and my belief that the present Russian regime and what it represents will not prevail. Peoples chained against their will will always eventually rise in the cry for the right to self-determination and states founded on nationalism, populism and autocracy will always eventually collapse. I strongly believe that democracy and freedom will always prevail. Or will it? We're talking about Fukuyama earlier on, and this is maybe where some of his thoughts or maybe some of the debate after his thoughts uh, come to life. Is liberal democracy actually prevailing? Will liberal democracy be able to solve the grave challenges our global society faces? Climate change, destruction of biodiversity, abuse of the planet's resources, terror, etc. Will some form of autocracy actually prove to be more efficient in solving these problems when you don't have to take the will of the people into consideration? Liberal democracies are generally tied to capitalism. Can capitalism actually solve the problems we have with poverty and growing inequality? And what about the technological development? Can we always be sure that the market makes the best technological solutions? Or is it more likely that the strive for short-term profits will be the driver for future te technological development? These and many more students, uh, these and many more questions, of course, sorry, are the ones we should ask ourselves. Are we naive? full of ourselves and Western centric in supposing we have found the solutions to it all? Is our view of the world too narrow? Do we have blind spots? And if so, where are they? No, of course we have not found the perfect system. It would be stupid to assume that and make that claim. But liberal democracy with all its many flaws and shortcomings have one property superior to any other form of social and political system. It has proven over the last couple of centuries to be better at securing the freedom of each individual by advocating the free distribution of thought and knowledge, including artistic expression. I will claim that liberal democracy does this better than any other form of government. This enables us to formulate the ideas of self-determination and the individual pursuit of happiness. It gives us the basis for pluralism and diversity. And as I said, the basic uh, basis for artistic expression. Quoting Winston Churchill, who as you know, will, uh, uh, who as you will know, was a conservative prime minister in Great Britain during World War II and deeply rooted in the British aristoc uh, arist aristocracy. Uh, Churchill said, no one pretends that democracy is perfect or all wise. Indeed, it has been said that democracy is the worst form of government except for all the other forms that have been tried from time to time. So on the basis of this very superficial argumentation, I will jump to the conclusion that having a political system based on liberal democracy is a prerequisite for free artistic expression. And also that free artistic expression is a prerequisite for liberal democracies. It's a circular argument, argument where one phenomenon is dependent on the other and if the chain is broken, you have neither free expression nor liberal democracies. In the form of liberal democracy that we call the welfare state, maybe especially in the Nordic social democratic version, the consensus is that everybody should be contributing to sustaining to society to the best of your ability through your daily work, paying taxes by participating in social life through civic institutions, etc. There's respect for the law of the land. People have trust in the public institutions and government. It can be argued that a social contract has been drawn up between the people and the state because a social society based on social, political and economic homogeneity and equality has successfully been established. 
But even in the Nordic countries, this balance is tipping and populism, taste for autocratic government and nationalism is showing its ugly face. This tendency we see all over the Western world where liberal democracies are under threat. Look at the US, look at Poland and Hungary, look at the present uh, presidential campaign in France and look at the political climate in, Swe in Scandinavia, in Denmark maybe particularly. Especially right-wing national conservative populism is gaining terrain all over the globe, but even center-left and center-right government, uh, governments use elements of populism in their communication and governing methods. Pluralism and complexity is definitely not in vogue at this time, uh, at this point in time. It's beyond the scope of this short talk to try to explain the reasons for this development, but it is clear to see that groups in society feel left out. They feel threatened by globalism. They lose their income. They cannot relate or connect to society as it develops and changes. People in rural areas feel underprivileged compared to people living in urban centers. And the less educated feel that the elite, the elite looks down on them and robs them of privileges and possibilities by embracing economic globalism. There are both social, economic, cultural, educational reasons for this uh, exodus from the political parties, the, the, the old political parties, so to speak, and the democratic bodies that were founded after World War II and the social system that they were based on. The liberal democracies have at one point in time especially failed tremendously. The European governments of the 1920s and the 1930s were, in hindsight, disastrously passive in standing up against totalitarian regimes and populism. And they were disastrously incapable of finding solution for all those that were attracted to fascism, communism, and other autocratic forms of government. Let us not repeat that mistake. As you mentioned, I, I work as a director of a music school for children in a suburb of Copenhagen. The music school, like other public music schools in Denmark, is an institution mainly funded by the municipality and as such very close, uh, is co collaborating very closely with local, the local government, other local arts institutions, the local community in general. The music school is in many ways looked on as other local institutions founded uh, or funded, sorry, uh, by the municipality, such as public schools, health services, daycare, and institutions for the elderly. The music schools have over the last decade or so changed from being institutions that primarily just taught children to play the violin or piano or electric guitar to now being an integrated part of our welfare system. This is a change of paradigm that cannot be overestimated. The public music schools have, as local arts institutions, changed their focuses from music for music's sake, uh, music's sake to music being instrumental, sorry, no pun intended, for creating communities, artistic experiences, and better quality of life for the people. One of my catchphrases these days is that we are also music schools for the children who don't play. In order to succeed in this task, we need to employ teachers with more and in many cases different competences than only musical. We need teachers that understand pedagogy beyond music pedagogy, who understands and are able to teach classrooms, who can not only play and teach music at a very high level, but can also use music as a tool for learning and social processes. We need teachers who understand and embrace the phenomenon, uh, the idea of the artistic citizenship. Educating musician, uh, musicians who has a deep understanding of this uh, change in paradigm requires a change not only in the mindset of each individual teacher, 
but also in the mindset of the students and maybe most importantly in the mindset of our institutions, our higher uh, music uh, the teaching institutions. This is not about devaluating musical training and saying that we all need to be kindergarten teachers. It is rather understanding that art and music has a set of properties that can enable the artist and musician to serve the public in more ways than giving them artistic or aesthetic experiences. We must obtain a willingness to take on a social responsibility and a responsibility to use our talents in creating in creating better quality of life for people, not only for the audiences in the concert halls. Extending my catchphrase from before, we have to be musicians for the people who don't listen to music. Artistic citizenship is, is, isn't about not making art. There is absolutely no doubt that music is of an enormous artistic value in its own right and brings both joy and insight to a lot of people. And in order to do this, we have to have the best and uppermost musical education. Artistic citizenship is about taking on additional obligations and acquiring more competences. It's about adding on, not throwing away. Higher music education institutions have an enormous responsibility in facilitating this change and in helping transform the mindsets of students and teachers. We need new ways to look at pedagogy, new ways to understand our audiences, new ways to look at the concept of the work. For example, in some pedagogical or social processes, the work can be the process in itself and not necessarily the end result. Now you maybe sit and wonder what on earth is he rambling on about? What has this to do with all he said in the beginning about populism and the liberal democracy? What it has it to do with the East-West divide? Well, maybe not so much actually. But it what um, but what it um, but it rather has to do uh, with the divide between liberal democracies and populist autocracies which of course today is represented in all its gruesomeness by the Russian government. And to be frank, I also think it has to, uh, to do about being progressive and, and uh, having the courage to look into the future uh, or to be conservative. I think it is enormously important that we as musicians and artists, well as citizens in our societies, understand that we cannot leave anybody behind. We have to be musicians and make music in its broadest sense for everyone. And that includes making music for the underprivileged, for the uneducated, for people who wouldn't dream of going to a concert listening to a Mahler symphony or a jazz concert. It includes making music for children, working in kindergartens and elementary schools, in retirement homes and hospitals, and working in projects of inclusion and integration. It has to do with deep understanding of co-creation, not about taking arts to the masses, which everybody since the 1970s has been talking about, about, but generally working with people where they are, creating music with them on equal terms and accepting that the process can be the work. Music making has to come back to being a social phenomenon, not always, not always an art form. This is all important if we want to contribute to maintaining the liberal democracy and advocating social uh, and avoiding, of course, sorry, and avoiding social polarization. In this context, it becomes very clear why higher arts education institutions and the management teachers and students in them must take uh, artistic citizenship very serious and promote the idea that through being part of society, we can promote change, communicate co complex topics, create communities and maintain relevance with the general public. By taking our artistic citizenship seriously, we can contribute to fighting polarization and populism and help sustaining and developing democracy democracy, the worst political system, except for all the other ones. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you very much. Very, very interesting and important conversation. And uh, I think 
it really made us think that, especially when we live now in the era of the declining superpower, uh, and we have the um, adversaries and the alternative that is not the liberal democracies, and that is the Russia and China, especially the artistic uh, citizenship and social responsibility comes forward in the higher arts education and higher music education. So thank you for this input. And uh, now we move on to uh, Hans uh, Helsten. Yeah. Uh, he's uh, been the professor of organ and uh, Malmö Academy of Music since 1992. Uh, he is involved in extensive uh, concert activities and has performed in most European countries as well as in the United States and Canada. In addition to teaching, and organ playing. Hans is also involved in helping congregations that need to acquire new instruments and participate in concert and festival production. Um, and today he holds the vice directorship position at Malmö Academy of Music at Lund University. So Hans, thank you for being with us and we'll be listening to you. Thank you very much. I would like to uh, make some short reflections on some key, uh, key concepts. Um, attached to um, music education today and my background to, to, to this uh, reflection will be the fact that I work with uh, music pedagogic uh, on a conservatory level. Uh, I think that, that why I make this reservation will be clear to you when I come to my third key concept. The first one is, well, no surprise, democracy. What is democracy? Uh, there are many definitions, but I think one, one that, that would, would provide a very good starting point for, for this reflection is that everybody has a voice. It's a musical definition of, of democracy, but a political one as well. Everybody has a voice. This voice can be used for voting, but it can, use, can be used for speaking, for discussing. Um, I think this is quite important. This does not mean, of course, that democracy is anarchy. I mean, everybody's not speaking at the same time. Uh, there is some kind, there are rules surrounding uh, this fact that everybody has a voice. Uh, there are rules, and there are institutions also. I mean, institutions in which these discussions between these different voices can take place. All this is very important. Uh, of course, there is a concept behind all this, and that's equality. If everybody has a voice, then everybody's equal. Uh, we don't have somebody who has two voices and another person having five and a uh, third one just having one. Everybody has one voice. Uh, so democracy is not anarchy. Uh, there are rules for the using of the voice. Uh, there are institutions for this, the using of the voices taking place somewhere. And equality is a concept attached very much to this. I think this has something to do with music education. Uh, if everybody has a voice, this applies both to professors and to students. And in principle, these voices are equal, in principle. But we know as musical educators that that is not the case. Why? Uh, we could discuss that through the grid of another uh, key concept here, and that's power. In democracy, power is still existing. Somebody has the power. The power is exercised, and it's visible uh, and present. So, for example, uh, and how does this have to do with the fact that everybody has a voice. Well, let's see. Uh, let's look at the, the relation between uh, a music professor and a music student. Of course, a music professor, professor has more power in the respect that he or she has more experience, uh, will probably be older, uh, <clears throat> will probably earn more money. Uh, well, many things. It's an asymmetrical relation. But there, that is not the complete story of it. It's asymmetrical, yes. But this relation has something that is a very important feature of democracy also. 
uh, of course, and that is how to use your voice and in what situations. And in democracy, I would say the concept here to be used is the concept of veto. This is very important. If we look at democracy, we have a government in power. There's not very much to be done about that. You can have, you can have discussion in the public sphere, etc. but the government is still there. But it can be vetoed away at certain occasions. So we, we all know that when we vote for different uh, governments, political parties, it's a kind of commercial thing. It has commercial sides to it. I mean, we, we, uh, we vote for people who sell us the best ideas. But this is not really the most important thing. The most important thing is that we can make them go away. We can use our voices, we can use them in the form of a veto. This is very important uh, for democracy. And this applies to music education as well. Of course, the, the music professor will know more and will have a greater psychological force also in convincing the student. But the student always has a veto. Always. Uh, and this, I think this is very important to know and reflect upon. So I've talked about democracy and the idea that everybody has a voice. I've talked about power, which we still have in democracy, but which is balanced by the mechanism of the veto. So democracy, power, and voice and veto. Now, my third concept. In music institutions on a high level, most of the teaching, uh, instrumental or vocal teaching, I'm not talking about, well, a lot of the theoretical teaching as well, is taking place in very small groups. And these groups are often so small that they are comprised only two persons. Uh, the music professor and the music student. There are, of course, variations, but this is kind of the basic setup. It's the one-to-one -one teaching situation. Uh, this is, and this, th this is a kind of primary, uh, hmm, now I'm contradicting myself, I realize. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I tried to say that this was a kind of primary pedagogical situation, and I was take, trying to give you an example of it, and I was taking the example of Jesus. Well, of course, that's a very bad example, because he did not do very much one-to-one -one teaching. I mean, he had his disciple, and they were about 11 or 12. I don't remember the exact number. Uh, so this is a bit different setup than in our conservatives, but let's assume it's basically the same idea, okay? We still have instrumental or vocal classes in our conservatories. Uh, what, ha what, what happens in these groups? Uh, what happens in these relationships between a master and his or her disciples? What happens? And here I will introduce a third concept, which might, uh, and now you understand why I emphasize that my background was in conservatory teaching. Uh, and not, uh, I am not a teacher of, of, of children. Because my third concept is seduction. This one I picked up from uh, a well-known writer, uh, George Steiner, and his book, uh, The Lessons of the Masters. It's a very thought-provoking book, published, I don't remember, perhaps 20 years ago or something. It was a reaction, his reaction to uh, uh, certain movements in the American university world. Um, and it's very provoking, this book. It's very provocative. But there are some very interesting thoughts about it. He talks about the relations, uh, the relationship between a master and his disciple. And he speaks, he uses words like power and passion. And he also uses the word of trust. I mean, you, you could, we could all see that these words kind of balance each other. But we must dare to speak about the passion as well. We are dealing with emotions. And we are dealing with our emotion not only between each other, because that's really secondary, but we are dealing about our emotions towards what we are doing, the music. 
this is very emotional and we use our emotions to, to work with this. Uh, so the passion is there. And then, of course, the seduction is very close. And it can be seen as something quite dangerous. It can be seen as a corrupt relationship between a master and his or her disciples. But it can also be seen as something quite valuable. It can also be seen as a kind of voluntary and temporary submission to uh, the knowledge and experience of somebody who is whom you value a lot. And here comes the concept of trust, of course. As a disciple, you are there because you want to be there and you have chosen to be there. But when you made this choice, you are not in an equal position. But you have made the choice to be in that position. I think this is, this is an area which we must dare to problematize and to talk about. Uh, we, I think it's quite interesting we, when we use the terminology of George Steiner. But we chose as a disciple to be in this situation. So we have still our own will. So I have a symmetry here between my concepts. I talked about democracy and the concept of voice. I talked about power and the concept of veto. And now, lastly, I talked about seduction, but counterbalanced by the concept of will. We put ourselves in this situation. Uh, so we still keep our voice. Well, this might have seen a bit abstract, but sometimes I believe it's, it's nice <laughs> uh, to, to use concepts and to talk about very important things in an abstract form. Um, and with this, the importance of, I think, seduction, but in the same time of not losing our will and not losing our reason when we are seduced. With this, I end my little reflection. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your input. It was really interesting. And from abstract, now we go to uh, down to uh, uh, the topic, and we have the uh, Davide Latashvili, who has uh, experienced both Georgian and then the Western uh, education, and his input will be interesting after this uh, presentations of you. Thanks again, Hans Helsten. Um, Davide Latashvili uh, was invited into the Juilliard School of uh, School in New York City in 2007, and he performed um, there and he gave his debut in 2010. He has participated in many international competitions, given recitals and appeared as a soloist with orchestras across Europe and America. Today, he is the PhD student at Pilsen State Conservatory while being a TV presenter and many Georgians' favorite TV personality. So, David, here we go. Greetings. Um, very happy and honored to be part of this discussion and uh, uh, very happy to listen to a wonderful gentleman give wonderful, very um, a colorful uh, presentation um, and a good thing about being the last one is that I can actually uh, say the least because most of the uh, ideas uh, were already projected but also were uh, as Iveri uh, told me kind of running out of time and I can't really say much of uh, anything new for a couple of reasons um, but the main one being um, that on our minds right now and you probably can relate to it. Uh, we have uh, Ukraine, and that's the only thing we are thinking about. And um, you're right, uh, Thomas, when mentioning that the title of this discussion was definitely uh, created uh, before we knew what uh, was about to happen. But it's um, uh, it's been going on since 2008. It's been going on since 1990, as Edgar has pointed out for us and for the uh, region. And somehow I think this is the time that we have to really finally merge 
and finally wake up and finally realize that um, uh, the responsibility we take as musicians or as music educators or as teachers or such students are not uh, solemnly uh, for as a performer and for as a just a simple persona going on stage or going in front of TV or going in front of a camera, but also we are the citizens of the world. We're the citizens of the country we belong to. And I think this is the time when we really need to think about not just uh, bringing more freedom into education and not just uh, making sure that we are modernizing and moving forward somehow in our little tiny uh, areas of expertise, but also in the sense that we are now really uh, in power, as Hans said, uh, and as Thomas said, and as Edgar said, we are in power of our passion, we're in power of our own voice, we are in power of our own talent, but this talent, this education, this experience is serving the whole world. This is serving the whole community. This is raising the uh, a whole uh, new generation of uh, people of human beings who then later on hopefully will create a better world we can live in and um this is uh, these are the sort of topics that i was surprised to hear when i first arrived to new york when i first entered the uh, juilliard school and um the first book i got handed to was by uh, our president of the Juilliard School back then, Joseph Polisi. Uh, it's um, Artist as a Citizen, a wonderful book. I suggest uh, uh, strongly. Uh, I realized that I was not just a young a teenager pursuing my dreams to suddenly become a better pianist with a great background given to me in a Georgian uh, music school. And you all know that uh, the music school education in Georgia is uh, um, uh, with a large history, with a great history, with uh, uh, teachers that really came and went to uh, teach and um, raise a wonderful generation of musicians. But uh, there and then I realized that I was not just a musician. I was not just uh, a wonderful soldier who is uh, taking orders and giving orders back to the fingers. And um, to skip, uh, uh, 10 years later, uh, when I came back to Georgia, uh, uh, when Edgars was speaking, I realized it's the same thing here. These youngsters now, they really realize that they get the voice. They really realize that they can make the difference. And, uh, and I think this is the time um, as the future teachers or the teachers or even the students have to really give them and give ourselves the chance to express ourselves completely without any rules, without any uh, uh, borders to be brought to them because um, that's what brought us to where we are right now <laughs> in the world. And I understand that rules are there to guide us better. And in order to break the rules, first we have to know them. And we do have that in Felicity Conservatoire and we do have that in every conservatoire. But I think this is the time we need to start thinking outside the box, thinking outside the small, tiny little rooms that we occupy on one-on-one -on -one, uh, lectures, which uh, can and will definitely give our uh, next generation's wonderful experience. But uh, this is the time to think globally. I'm saying all these general topics, but I guess that's the only thing we have right now against uh, the enemy uh, north to us and uh, uh, east to you. Um, but uh, hopefully uh, the next time we meet uh, will be in an independent, united Georgia with Abkhazia and Ossetia being again part of Georgia in a maybe Toulouse Conservatoire Grand Concert Hall where we can all perform for each other and share the um, achievements that we did in the few months ahead of our actual physical meeting rather than talk about the horrific event in or the wish, wishful thinking freedom in the musical education i'll stop here because i think this is exactly the time we are given by iveri and the conservatoire but maybe we can have a couple of words to share as a dialogue thank you so much thank you thank you david so much uh, for your input and
I'm not I'm not a professional journalist or TV presenter, so I, I can be excused that I can be a bit <laughs> extended the timing. Uh, anyway, it was really, really interesting. I just want to uh, give all of you uh, maybe just one minute to conclude the session uh, and we can start with the same order and maybe uh, you could just reflect on the today's situation. Are we really going back? Did the process of democratization really worked or are we in the uh, era of new Ber uh, Berlin Wall and at the same time what do you think of course it is a broad um, uh, question and that cannot be answered in just one minute uh, but what do you think are we entering the period that, that we're still multi-layered development and this uh, eastern part of the Europe and eastern part of the world uh, is not uh, answering the uh, questions that we ask in the western part and with the uh, social responsibility and the um, uh, artistic citizenship of the musicians are we are we there that the gap even yeah in the west we're going forward and that we're becoming more inclusive and more diverse but uh, does this make the gap even wider because the, uh, do you think that the Eastern uh, musical institutions are not keeping up as it should be because of the democratization and translation problems? We can start with Edgar's and then we can go with the same order as the presentations. Thank you, Ivery. Uh, well, I was very glad to hear from today's presenters the ideas about giving voice and opportunity to marginalized communities and also uh, rem reminding us of the veto power of the student. In the democratic world, it really is an option. In the Soviet uh, sphere, it so certainly was not as big of an option. So, yeah, I'm glad that we are moving in that direction. And uh, also about the uh, similarities between the former Soviet countries. Um, yeah, I, I certainly share the sentiment of both being able to observe the young generation as uh, uh, the heralds of new era and uh, those who are able to represent the 21st century in its, uh, well, let's say entirety, not uh, being the somewhat residual effects of the Soviet Union <laughs> as myself. But um, what I am concerned about, uh, 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 and specifically from the standpoint of censorship, is that uh, from inst institutionalized censorship, uh, we have shifted towards the informal social censorship and specifically self-censorship within the artistic community. And it is worldwide and it is um, uh, economically motivated and sometimes uh, socially validated uh, or uh, motivated by social validation or uh, lack thereof. And uh, somehow I fear that uh, uh, this, in uh, combination with uh, various populist movements around the world uh, who are trying to take over uh, the governments both in the East and the West, uh, might present us with a certain challenge. However, I hope those challenges will be somewhat new, although I keep in mind that uh, there is nothing new in this world, only things we have forgotten and then we come to realization, oh, they have returned with a new iteration. So that's all from me. Thank you. Intriguing. Thomas, what do you think? Maybe with the microphone. We we can come back to you and we can hear first from Hans and then we can come back to Thomas. I must also forget to unmute. Um, I think there is no way back, as a matter of fact, when you have, once you have discovered that you have a voice. Uh, and I think that is valid also on a collective level. Uh, I don't think there is a way back. Of course, there will be temporary returns. I, I doubt, and that, that it will be a hard time and there will be fights. But I think that, uh, well, I believe strongly myself that we will learn better and better as a humanity to think together, as a matter of fact. And I think music is, can, might serve as a model there. Music is a very, very good model for thinking together, working together, uh, and configurating uh, your own personal will uh, against the, the collective will. I think music provides us with very good models. Thank you. 
Now I even worked out. Now I even worked out how to work my computer. Yeah. Uh, I think Hans is absolutely right, and I think that is uh, a very important point. That music is a very good medium for working together. It's a very good uh, basis for actually collaborating and for uh, sharing thoughts and artistic ideas and so on. Uh, to your questions about whether the, you know we're widening the gap, I must say that yes, temporarily maybe. You know, I mean, but as Hans also said, I, I do think, and as I said in my own presentation, I do actually think that liberal democracies and the and the pluralism and the you know everything that goes with that will will actually prevail. There is no way back. And also, I want to say that you know I've been working quite a lot uh, on many international and global um uh, projects and and you know i've been working with uh, universities and conservatoires in africa and in asia and in uh, all but south america all sorts of places and i've found so many very very progressive ideas in places where you would not think that they would uh, come from you know so i've so i i, I think it's not about east and west it's about of, of north and south for that matter it's about uh about uh, th you know making these communities and these societies where you can actually uh, work together you know it, with and in music and and being able to share ideas and share artistic experiences and so on uh, so and i think that the way that we influence each other is maybe the, the actually the most important thing so working together is the way forward absolutely thank you david would you wrap up Absolutely. I won't be anything, I won't be able to say anything original, but uh, to go back to again what Edgar said, you know, there's only my way or the wrong way of playing. If, if you think of that attitude from a teacher, then um, that teacher is not ready to receive our voice. The teacher is not ready to hear our voice. And possibly perhaps that teacher is not very talented and should not be teaching at all <laughs> but if you are serving music and if you are serving art and if you are an artist as a true artist not just as a performer but as maybe that person who has never even heard music can suddenly become a musician then there is no way we cannot coexist and yes maybe the gap is something suddenly uh, growing larger just because mr putin decided to throw a little bomb there but definitely uh, we already saw, and especially with the use of modern technology, again, the first thing that brought everyone together was the Ukrainian anthem. And it was music that, again, uh, won over the uh, uh, ugly monster that is trying to somehow ruin everything that was ever created by the artists. And it's always going to stay that way. And I think people are underestimating how much power we as musicians have. but you know, we'll gain that power again and spread the love and uh, reunite all the um, good uh, people around the world. And I'm sure that we will definitely uh, win at the end. Thank you. Thank you for that input, everybody. Today I was uh, playing the concert at Palladium in Malmö, Malmö and uh, I was playing the Russian music, uh, Stravinsky Firebird, and then I, then I said that, and it was premiered in 1909 in Paris. And at the presenting, I said that, yeah, first they started poisoning us by the astonishing music, and now they went to the chemical weapons, and we don't know where it's going. But thank you, everyone. And uh, for the audience, I want to say that we this project is about also the inclusion. So with the next session that we have on 21st of March, there will be all women uh, panel. So we are not discriminated against. And uh, thanks again to Thomas Winter, Ed Karagiskis, uh, Hans Helsten, and David Aladashvili. And we we'll see you next Monday, March 21st at 4 CET. Thank you, Ivery. Bye, thank you.